My name is David Stockdale, and I'm a YouTube influencer with really good stats. I help aspiring YouTubers improve their performance. This is Davey Knows Best. Nightmare Masterclass is an up-and-coming YouTuber who's looking to kick it up a notch in terms of their online presence. Yeah, I guess I've, I've sort of plateaued at around 50,000 subscribers, and I'm, I'm hoping there's a way to increase that amount. Well, for starters, you could dress a little bit nicer, you know, maybe some khakis and a polo. I, I don't think I'm going to do that. Uh, it says here you're a Marxist. Well, yes, unlike a lot of people who call themselves Marxist, I'm actually an orthodox Marxist. Your biggest claim to fame is a 10 hour long analysis of a creepy web series called uh, Pet Scoop. Um, it, it's called Pet Scoop, actually, and it's it's really a brilliant series. I mean, I don't really even know where to be. The channel has had one flash in the pan success in his career as an influencer. By inadvertently capitalizing on the popularity of a niche web series, his channel was able to garner a small following. But at this point, it has basically stopped growing. That's where I come in. Um, so for starters, you need to make videos about things that people have actually heard of. Yeah, I, I hear you. Um, I mean, well, my next video is about an HBO series. See, now you're catching on. Let me guess, you're doing a video about Pennyworth? It's the origin of Batman's butler. Um, that sounds cool, but no, I'm actually doing a video about a very strange comedian by the name of Nathan Fielder, uh, and his new show on HBO is called The Rehearsal. I was thinking about calling my video The Rehearsal, Art in the Age of Disintegration. Okay but we need something a little bit snappier for the actual title. What does this fielder guy do? Well, um, basically he messes with people's heads. He's kind of gone viral as of late because people think he's exploitative. Perfect. The plan? Increase traffic on Nightmare Masterclass by capitalizing on the controversy surrounding comedian Nathan Fielder. Hello and welcome to Nightmare Masterclass. My name is David Stockdale. I'll be your host on this excursion into the dark unknown. In this installment, I'd like to discuss The Rehearsal, a series on HBO created by a comedian named Nathan Fielder. At first glance, The Rehearsal might seem like yet another one of Fielder's comedic vehicles. You might think it's yet another parodic reality TV show like Nathan For You. In a certain sense, this is true. However, after a thorough inspection of the material, I have reason to believe that there is something extremely weird going on with this TV show. Similar to Nathan For You, the events that take place within the series are generally depicted as real, except of course with respect to rehearsal scenarios. We'll, we'll get into it in a little bit here. The inherent difficulty of forming meaningful relationships was a recurring theme in Nathan For You, and the rehearsal picks up where Nathan For You left off in that regard. As the show progresses, the question of what is real becomes more and more pressing. I think it's fair to say that there's a deeper subtext embedded within the series that is certainly worth taking a look at. It's clear enough upon an initial viewing that the rehearsal is trippy, and perhaps one might even say it's a bit convoluted. If you haven't yet watched the series for yourself, I would strongly encourage you to do so prior to watching this video. In my opinion, this is one of the most remarkable shows of 2022, so don't miss it. I assure you, if you're generally a fan of the works I cover on this channel, you're not going to be disappointed. Ostensibly, the premise of the rehearsal is as follows. Nathan helps a certain person tackle a difficult scenario by rehearsing that scenario over and over again in a setting that allows for astounding accuracy. In a sense, the subject is rehearsing for their own life. 
the idea of rehearsing for some predefined scenario, a difficult conversation, for example, is rooted in an extreme form of neurosis. And to a neurotic such as myself, the sheer precision of Fielder's various simulations is deeply satisfying. I mean, who hasn't wanted to create a decision tree for every potential interaction in their life? It's almost as though HBO gave an enormous budget to someone with severe OCD and basically gave them carte blanche to do whatever they wanted. The show is aware of this. It nods at the viewer, almost as if to say, hey, isn't it crazy they're letting us do this? The desire to control one's interactions with such attention to detail is inherently absurd, and a lot of the comedy in the rehearsal stems from this absurdity. At first, Fielder's role is that of an external mediator. He's managed to obtain a fairly substantial budget from HBO, and he wields this production in order to perform an intervention of sorts on the subject. But at a certain point, the show starts to enter existential territory. In short, the rehearsal very quickly stops being about the subject Fielder is trying to help, and instead the show becomes a bewildering meta-narrative about Fielder himself. This is where things get really interesting. A lesser artist might well have rested on the show's basic premise as a formula for creating an endless series of boilerplate, episode of the week type entries. While that would certainly be entertaining, Fielder clearly has grander ambitions for this project. One might argue that the rehearsal is an attempt to lampoon reality TV in general. This is true in a very broad sense, just as it's true of Nathan For You, yet a more precise reading is readily available. I would argue that, on one level, the rehearsal is about the dubious nature of Fielder's comedy, and at another level, a deeper level, it's about the difficulty of connecting with other people in modern society. A straightforward psychological observation would be as follows. Fielder seems to be grappling with the morally ambiguous terrain of his prior work. The absolute truth of this is tenuous at best, after all, we have no way of distinguishing Nathan Fielder, the comedian, from Nathan Fielder, the self-involved, socially awkward character that is depicted in both Nathan For You and The Rehearsal. Fielder has stated in prior interviews that he is playing an exaggerated version of himself, and this is fair enough, plenty of comedians do this. However, when it comes to any particular interpretation of The Rehearsal, one cannot simply rest on the idea that details revealed within the series reflect some genuine truth with respect to Fielder himself. There are obviously seeds of truth here and there, embedded within the layers upon layers of metafiction showcased in the rehearsal. Perhaps it would be fair to say that the depiction of Nathan Fielder is honest and authentic in a figurative sense, but not true, strictly speaking, in literal terms. Or at least that's my best guess at what's going on. Some of my preceding statements might prove to be somewhat bizarre or out of context. I might be jumping the gun a little bit. It would suffice to say at this point that I believe the rehearsal can be understood as a structural critique of modern society, largely with respect to its domestic facets. It might not be immediately evident upon an initial viewing of the series, but I believe it's clear upon further inspection that the rehearsal is not simply an autobiographical meta-narrative about Fielder. There is certainly that aspect of the work but I'm convinced the rehearsal is in some sense a critique of the solipsism inherent to Fielder's particular form of neurosis. And so, the idea that it's a meta-narrative about Fielder is itself part of the joke. It's a farcical performance of neuroticism that frankly hits a little too close to home, yet when it comes to the work itself, we have yet to really scratch the surface. What follows is a systematic breakdown of each episode of the rehearsal. I believe that by unpacking each installment, we will come to learn something about the meaning of this beautifully strange little series. In the following breakdown, I will be referring to Fielder by his first name, Nathan, whenever he appears on camera. The purpose of this is to distinguish Nathan Fielder, the comedian, from Nathan, the exaggerated character depicted in both Nathan For You and The Rehearsal. 
In the very first episode of the rehearsal, Nathan helps a guy who is trying to come clean to his friend about the fact that he doesn't have a master's degree. This episode, aptly titled Orange Juice No Pulp, establishes the premise of the rehearsal. Like Nathan For You, this show entails the host, Nathan Fielder, helping someone accomplish a goal. In the case of Nathan For You, Nathan would contrive outlandish schemes in order to help business owners increase profitability. Based on what is conveyed in this episode of the rehearsal, it would seem that Nathan is intent on continuing his mission to improve people's lives. Yet we will soon realize this is an artful deception. The first episode is a bit of a misdirect in terms of the broader trajectory of the show. The rehearsal is really about Nathan himself. More on that later. For now, let's focus on the first episode. Towards the very beginning of the episode, Nathan says, I'm not good at meeting people for the first time. Nathan explains that he often uses humor to break the ice in social interactions. It's established that Nathan has posted a Craigslist ad in order to find people to help. The ad reads, Opportunity. Is there something you're avoiding? One respondent, Cora Skeet, reveals that he has misled his team of trivia nerds by making them think he has a master's degree. The master's degree, of course, signifies a certain level of professionalism and sophistication. Skeet had wished to impress upon his friends that he is highly educated and thus a valuable asset when it comes to trivia competitions. Skeet is routinely reminded of this deceit whenever his friends send him a job posting with a master's degree as one of the requirements. At this point, he really just wants to come clean to his teammates and move past it. Nathan asserts that a happy outcome doesn't have to be left to chance. He reveals that he has rehearsed various scenarios with an actor, K. Todd Freeman, in order to prepare for this very moment. Skeet is intrigued by Nathan's pitch, but he expresses concern that they will not be able to predict an extreme outcome. It's clear that Skeet isn't entirely sold on the idea. He's concerned about one particular friend's reaction. Her name is Trisha. Cor explains to Nathan that she might get a little volatile. Nathan expresses via voiceover narration that he's starting to get a little bit insecure about his interactions with Cor, in particular a lame joke that didn't quite land. He worries that Cor doesn't fully trust him. So in an effort to build a stronger bond, Nathan takes Cor skeet shooting. Surely this is a playful joke given the subject's name is Cor Skeet. In order to ingratiate himself with Cor, Nathan rigs the event so that they both miss every single target. Nathan then arranges for the two of them to go swimming together. He shares with Cor that he was married for three years. Nathan shares this personal detail in order to build the subject's trust, but importantly, he arranges for them to be interrupted so that he doesn't have to share any further details. Nathan himself is a bit guarded. It is then relayed that Nathan hired an actor, Gigi Bergdorf, to play Cor's friend. Nathan and Cor settle on a place for Cor to confront Trisha. They land on a bar called the Alligator Lounge. Specifically, the confession is to take place during a trivia game. Nathan reveals to Cor that he has created an exact replica of the Alligator Lounge. Skeet sees the appeal of rehearsing his confession in a highly accurate replica of the bar. He aptly compares Nathan to Willy Wonka. This comparison confuses Nathan a bit, seeing as Willy Wonka victimized children, but he takes it mostly as a compliment. The rehearsal begins. Bergdorf performs the role of Trisha with astonishing precision. Nathan uses flowchart software in order to determine what he refers to as the optimal path for Core's confession. Nathan directs Core to interrupt his friend in the likely event that she starts talking nonstop. This is one of Trisha's notable character traits. One major hurdle emerges as the rehearsal progresses. Korski takes Trivia Night very seriously. In his words, trivia is sacrosanct. If they start losing, it will be a major distraction. Cor reveals that if he and Trisha end up losing the game, Cor might bail on the confession entirely. To remedy this, Nathan plants the answers in Cor's head without his knowledge by staging an elaborate series of encounters 
in which the information is casually relayed to him by various actors. The rehearsal continues. At this stage, it's necessary to prepare Kor for the worst possible scenario. It goes something like this. Trisha becomes livid. The whole crowd hears Kor's confession and makes fun of him. And, to top it off, he loses Trivia Night. This is the nightmare scenario. Nathan later reassures Kor that he doesn't believe the real confession will go that poorly. Now comes the moment of truth. At first, Kor hesitates. Nathan has gone to absurd lengths to prepare Kor for this encounter, yet it seems there is simply no accounting for what someone will actually do when the rubber hits the road. After a fair amount of stalling, Kor finally comes clean. In fact, he shares even more than he had originally planned. It would seem that Kor has dropped some of his defensive walls. Kor talks about his negligent father and his various insecurities. Fortunately, Trisha is highly receptive to Kor's confession. She doesn't appear to be even remotely angry that he lied. At this point, it is relayed that Nathan had Kor rehearse for the evening after the event as well, accounting for both positive and negative scenarios. In the final scene of the episode, Nathan comes clean about planting the trivia answers in Kor's head. Yet, it is revealed that he only really confessed to the actor playing Kor, the great K. Todd Freeman, while the real Kor remains oblivious to this artful deception. In the course of helping Kor, Nathan has ironically failed to do the very thing that he coached Kor to do, i.e. take a risk and tell the truth. The song Pure Imagination from Willy Wonka plays, leaving the viewer feeling ambivalent about the events that have transpired. Based solely on this episode alone, one might get the sense that the rehearsal has a certain formula to it. Nathan helps the subject rehearse a difficult scenario over and over until the optimal path has been identified. They encounter certain challenges related to the subject's various neuroses, and finally, the subject goes through with the difficult scenario, and we get to see the fallout. It's a formula that would seem ideal in relation to the standard reality TV show format. It's really not unlike Bar Rescue or perhaps even The Dog Whisperer, only in this case the dog is a person. Yet, this formula is casually abandoned in subsequent episodes and gradually things go off the rails, leading to both existential angst and a certain kind of metaphysical vertigo that I have never seen before on TV. Let's proceed to episode 2. In this episode, Nathan helps a woman try to experience what it's like to have a child in order to prepare her for parenthood. It is not all that surprising that Fielder has opted to explore this facet of modern life. In general, there is an increased amount of neuroticism surrounding the idea of parenthood, as many young adults have opted not to have children, largely due to broader economic conditions. The ones that have chosen to be parents are increasingly sensitive to any potentially negative outcome for their child. The second episode begins in media rest, with Nathan prompting his staff to scramble in order to ensure that consistency is maintained in a certain rehearsal scenario. Specifically, Nathan is concerned that a baby is not wearing the same hat as another baby. These are presumably two different child actors. His dedication to the authenticity of the scenario is on full display as a switcheroo is performed between these two infants. We are then introduced to a new subject, Angela. She's 44 years old. She wants a kid, but she's been putting it off because the circumstances haven't been quite right. Nathan stages an elaborate scenario in which Angela adopts a baby named Adam. He calls attention to the fact that the handoff is not entirely realistic. Typically, in the real world, the biological mother would not be there to hand off the child. It is established that Angela is a devout Christian with very particular opinions about her faith. For example, she accepts some so-called extra-biblical texts, but not others. She goes on a blind date with a man who clearly couldn't care less about the nuances of her belief system. She goes on another blind date and ends up getting along quite well with her date. 
another eccentric Christian named Robin. It is then relayed that the laws surrounding child labor present certain complications for the production. They need to use a robot for nighttime filming. A pivotal moment occurs. Whereas Nathan previously had established a rule that the staff could not participate in the simulation, when it comes to taking care of the child, Nathan himself offers to babysit the kid while Angela is on her date with Robin. He inserts himself into the rehearsal. This might not seem significant upon a first viewing of the rehearsal, but Nathan's increasingly prominent role in his very own simulation is an essential part of the narrative presented to us. Angela is a really intense person. The production captures footage of her praying. She asks God to show the production that it is not them choreographing the process, but rather God himself. Robin tentatively agrees to co-parent with Angela. He too is quite an intense person, although Robin's eccentricities are more varied than Angela's. For instance, Robin has a fixation on numerology. He constantly sees meaning in every single arbitrary number that he comes across. Robin also has a tenuous relationship with his roommate. He expresses concern that his roommate doesn't believe in Jesus. Robin's roommate expresses skepticism towards numerology, leading to a bizarre conflict. There are a number of red flags that would seem to indicate that Robin might not be the best father. For starters, he has no qualms about driving while high on marijuana. He also doesn't seem to think it's a problem that he doesn't have a license plate. The guy Nathan hired to make sure Angela gets up at night to check on the baby is a character. He starts talking about Bigfoot sightings. Robin ends up bailing on his very first night at the house. Here's another important plot point with respect to the broader series. Nathan has the production bring the Alligator Lounge replica back to LA. He then offers to be Angela's partner. Angela expresses that she has wanted more communication during this process. Despite this, she reluctantly agrees. Nathan makes calls to the parents of various child actors in order to get their permission to play the role of father. He uses a dialogue tree that has been engineered to get the parents' consent. He laughs awkwardly during a conversation with one parent, and it is casually revealed that even this small chuckle has been scripted. This raises a disturbing question. Has there been any sincere moment with Nathan in this show thus far? When it comes to Angela, the difficulties of locating a suitable partner pose a major challenge in this episode. The first hurdle would seem to be compatibility. Recall that Angela's first blind date, during which she expresses some rather arcane interests, specifically so-called extra-biblical texts such as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Her date can only respond with a polite nod and a blank stare. Angela asks him what his deepest fear is, and he responds, eels. So that's the level he's operating at. Angela's interest in extra-biblical texts stems from her desire to determine the will of God. It is not an intellectual curiosity, per se. It's a matter of salvation. Angela takes her religion very seriously, and it seems absolutely necessary that her partner feel the same way. It is not specified within the rehearsal, but my guess would be that Angela practices some form of evangelical Christianity. It's not difficult to imagine why she has not found a husband at this stage in her life. Her standards are very particular. This is especially difficult in this historical moment because the U.S. is now experiencing an accelerated process of secularization. According to a recent Gallup poll, U.S. church membership among adults is now below 50% meaning the majority of people in the country do not actively practice any particular faith. When you narrow that scope of believers down to those who not only attend church regularly, but also adhere to Angela's specific brand of Christianity, well, the numbers aren't on her side, folks. And so it is all the more devastating when Robin bails. On paper, he would seem to conform with Angela's standards, but he proves to be unreliable. A flake, if you will. This episode illustrates the immense difficulty of maintaining relationships in the face of various challenges associated with modernity. Perhaps it would be fair to say that despite their obvious differences, Nathan and Angela are kindred spirits, at least insofar as they both have difficulty connecting with other people. 
On that note, this episode demarks the breach of a certain threshold in terms of Nathan's role in the rehearsal. First, Nathan offers to babysit for Angela when she can't find childcare in time to make it to her blind date. Then, he offers to be Angela's co-parenting partner in her rehearsal scenario. It's presented as a matter of necessity. In Angela's ideal situation, she would have a partner, a husband, to help her raise her child. And so, in Nathan's mind, the implementation of this component, the partner, is essential to the simulation. While Nathan admits that he stands to benefit from his participation in this parenting simulation, after all, he too is curious about what it would be like to be a parent, the manner in which he pitches this idea to Angela is interesting, especially in hindsight when you consider his persuasion methods with respect to other involved parties, namely the parents of all the various child actors participating in this project. When Nathan asks Angela if she would be okay with his involvement in the role of father, Angela initially gives an ambivalent response. She says that she needs time to prey on it. Yet, just seconds later, she agrees to give it a shot. It's clear that Angela is not exactly comfortable with the ever-shifting nature of the rehearsal. Whereas previously Nathan had simply been there to spearhead the production and offer guidance to the subject, in this episode Nathan begins to play a direct role in the simulation itself. An important boundary has been crossed. It's not an ethical boundary per se. After all, there is no ethically relevant distinction between creating a simulation and participating in that simulation. In either case, it's really more about how you approach the activity than the basic premise of these roles. Previously, it had been established that no member of the production would assist with childcare. The boundary was not established for ethical reasons, rather it was established to preserve the integrity of the simulation. The entire point of this rehearsal is to demonstrate to the subject the experience of being a parent. If the subject has extra help from the production, help that of course would not be applicable to a genuine parenting situation, that of course lowers the fidelity of the simulation. Yet. Nathan finds a workaround, a way to insert himself into the narrative. He rationalizes it based on the necessity of a male partner in this scenario, and despite their obvious incompatibility, Nathan convinces Angela to partner up. He assures her that it isn't a romantic partnership, but rather one based on a mutually beneficial outcome. The rationale Nathan offers to convince Angela is precisely the thing that compromises this simulation. And yet, it is sadly the case that a number of loveless marriages are founded on this very premise, so perhaps in a way, it is realistic. Note that the episode is called Scion. Of course, Scion has a number of meanings. In the show, it's simply a type of car. Robin crashed his Scion, presumably during one of his manic episodes. But Scion can also mean a shoot or twig, especially one cut for the purpose of being grafted on some other tree. This is precisely what Nathan is doing with his makeshift family. Angela's rehearsal is merely an offshoot of Nathan's broader plan, in which multiple scenarios are explored, largely pertaining to Nathan's various neuroses. And increasingly, certain phrases are used so as to imply a dual meaning. In my view, this has thematic significance. First, it was Wonka as dream maker, Wonka as sociopath. And now we have another term with the dual meaning. Scion as car, Scion as offshoot. The work is conditioning the viewer to apprehend numerous layers of narrative and meta-narrative elements. In the third episode, Nathan helps a guy trying to get his share of his grandfather's inheritance. Towards the beginning of the episode, Nathan and his pretend son Adam dress up like Batman and Robin for Halloween. This displeases Angela. Angela explains to Nathan that she doesn't celebrate Halloween because according to her, it's the highest satanic holiday of the year. She then implores Nathan to open his eyes to reality. Nathan faces a new challenge in his career. He now has to juggle his duties as a father with his other work on the rehearsal. On a related note, there is a new subject in this episode, Patrick. As you might have guessed, Patrick 
has a problem. Patrick's grandfather has passed away. His grandfather has specified in his will that if Patrick wants to get his share of the inheritance money, he is explicitly forbidden from dating a quote-unquote gold digger, someone who is only with him to get his money. And so, Patrick now has to convince his brother, the executor of their grandfather's estate, to give him his share of the inheritance. In order to do this, Patrick has to offer a credible explanation for why his current girlfriend is not a gold digger. In one rehearsal scenario, Nathan observes that the subject is using an anti-Semitic stereotype, but he tolerates it for the sake of authenticity. It's how the subject would actually communicate with his brother. This demonstrates one important characteristic of our friend Nathan. He is willing to compromise his ethics in certain scenarios for the sake of realism. Nathan gets home late and doesn't have time to read his fake kid a bedtime story. He suddenly has an epiphany. Nathan has not accounted for the emotional component of his various simulations. To remedy this, Nathan stages his most convoluted scheme yet. He wants to hire an actor to play the grandfather of Patrick's fake brother. That is to say, the actor playing Patrick's brother. In order to more closely simulate the emotional significance of the real conversation Patrick has to have with his real brother, Nathan sets it up so that the actor's grandfather will have a bonding experience with Patrick and thus include Patrick in his will. It's all very confusing, so I wouldn't fault you for not following what's going on. Patrick helps the grandfather change his underwear, which is precisely the same deed Patrick cites for why he deserves his share of the inheritance with respect to his real grandfather. Thus, Patrick must now deal with his acting partner in a situation that parallels the precise terms of his real-life conundrum. The genius of this plan is as follows. The subject has been thrust into the same situation he was supposed to be rehearsing for a conversation with financial stakes which hinges on whether or not his girlfriend is a gold digger. Nathan watches TV with his pretend son, Adam. They watch some unspecified kids program. Interestingly, the theme of the program is lying. A caterpillar speaks with a man about his deceptive behavior. The man defends himself, claiming that he doesn't make a habit of lying. The caterpillar is dismissive. He says, then I can't believe anything you say. This, I believe, is more than a simple fly-on-the-wall type scene. Rather, it's a subtle bit of meta-commentary pertaining to the rehearsal and more broadly, Nathan's comedic persona in general. The simulation is extremely effective. Nathan's goal of eliciting an emotional response has been accomplished. Patrick starts crying. He pleads with his fake brother to give him his share of the inheritance, so that he can finally get closure. One gets the sense that Patrick is being entirely honest. It's almost as though in this moment, Patrick believes that he's talking to his real brother. Later at the homestead, it's clear that Nathan's work is interfering with his ability to participate in the parenting simulation. Nathan's pretend child Adam expresses frustration when Nathan leaves for work. Back at work, Patrick ghosts Nathan. He never hears from Patrick again. Nathan concludes that perhaps for some, the rehearsal alone is enough. Yet again, it would seem that this episode will not have a clear resolution. Nathan and Angela decide to hire a nanny to help with childcare. While at face value this would seem to negate the premise of this particular simulation, having a nanny is a realistic scenario for a relatively affluent couple in which both parents are obligated to work full time. Nathan relays that he had a photo album created with fake memories in order to better simulate his new family experience. It is then relayed to us that time works differently in the rehearsal. Jumps in time are necessary in order to simulate different stages of childhood and early adolescence. In Nathan's words, nature's timeline has to be accelerated. The previous actor playing Adam is replaced with an older child actor in order to simulate the passage of time. Angela reveals the depths of her eccentricity when she claims Google is controlled by the devil. Towards the end of the episode, Nathan turns over a bell pepper to hide the label. His aim is to hide the fact that it actually hasn't been grown at the homestead. It's store-bought. And that is a perfect note to end on. 
this episode wears its heart on its sleeve. It's about the transactional nature of relationships in our present moment. Relationships are now mediated through an essentially transactional paradigm. That is to say, the insipid influence of money has invaded all aspects of family relations. I believe that what Fielder is choosing to highlight is significant to the broader themes of the rehearsal. Everything merits scrutiny. In this episode, Angela requests that her simulation be arranged such that a so-called homestead is built in order to replicate her desired lifestyle. In the historical context of the United States, Homesteading is commonly understood as a practice by which the federal government provided any U.S. citizen who has agreed to settle on a piece of land for at least five years with ownership over that land. The original Homestead Act was signed into law in 1862, a time when land was plentiful in the U.S. Of course, that land was stolen by brute force, but that's not something the government will acknowledge. In 1976, during the onset of the neoliberal order, the practice of homesteading ended, with the U.S. shifting its policy to retain public lands in the West. The rehearsal depicts the replication of a homesteading scenario. The replication is meticulous in some respects, yet it's clear that the work is self-aware of the absurdity this entails. At times, the show very clearly calls attention to the artifice of the situation. Crops are not planted per se, rather they are simply buried in the ground, ready to be easily plucked from the dirt at the appropriate interval in the simulation. It's abundantly clear that a vast amount of labor and energy is required in order to sustain this operation. Therein lies the humor and the playful subtext. Americans, in particular middle-class suburbanites, labor under a number of illusions. At this stage in history, we can now order various commodities and have them delivered on the same day. We aren't made privy on how these commodities are produced exactly, nor do we typically bear witness to the general process of distribution. Instead, we click a button and the product magically appears at our doorstep some hours later. This is the apex of capitalism. While the term homesteading persists to this day, the meaning has been distorted. In the contemporary malaise of what I can best describe as late neoliberal capitalism, homesteading has been severed in key respects from its original meaning. Homesteading has instead become a consumer identity as opposed to any particular arrangement with the government. Influencers commonly use the term homesteading to refer to a situation in which an individual has purchased a plot of land, typically in a rural area, in order to live a more sustainable lifestyle. As such, it would be fair to say that the term has undergone a significant transformation. We have moved away from the direct representational form in which homesteading is commonly understood as a matter of property relations, which of course has implications with respect to one's class position, to a nebulous space in which the aesthetic of homesteading is privileged over any particular class dynamic. Class is brushed under the rug in favor of an amorphous, ever-shifting ideal, a consumer identity. In the fourth episode, Nathan teaches an acting class based on the so-called Fielder Method. Towards the beginning of the episode, Angela claims to have been a heavy drinker and illicit drug user prior to her religious conversion. In the next scene, Nathan takes a plane to LA where he has established a studio to train actors in order to acquaint them with the rehearsal process. One student suggests that Nathan's method entails stalking one subject. Nathan enthusiastically agrees. The actors are depicted largely as a bunch of woo-woo types. One of them makes a reference to their third eye. Nathan tells his students to find a primary to shadow. He then decides to relive the day from a student's perspective. Nathan portrays an actor named Thomas in this simulation. An actor loosely resembling Nathan stands in as the teacher. His performance is decidedly lifeless and devoid of energy. Nathan observes that the formal environment makes the lesson less fun. To remedy this, he has the students form a circle in the next lesson. 
Actors relay their experiences following their primary around. Nathan confronts Thomas, who hasn't gathered much, if any, information about his primary. He advises Thomas to accidentally spill something in order to initiate a conversation. Nathan then relives day two, again from Thomas's perspective, and is reassured about the general process. As the day winds to a close, Nathan attempts to check in with Angela to no avail. She does not answer his calls. On day three of the class, the students embody their primary's various professions. One is a butcher, another is a mechanic. It's clear they are very inexperienced at their primary's craft. Nathan suggests the students actually work in their respective professions in order to gain more experience. One student jokingly protests, I don't want to work, he says. In a quick one-on-one -on -one conversation, Thomas relays his attempt to get to know his primary. He lied about losing his late father's lucky guitar pick in order to initiate a conversation. Thomas tells Nathan that he doesn't like lying to people. Nathan flatly responds, neither do I. Nathan starts to get the sense that Thomas has been uncomfortable with the fielder method. He then relives the first day as Thomas again to see if he's missed something. He feels a rush when he sees the cameras. He questions the premise of the show. And then he reluctantly signs the release form without reading it. Nathan retraces Thomas's steps and his feelings about the process become more and more ambivalent. Despite this, Nathan suggests that Thomas live in an apartment similar to his primaries, but it's implied that this is an elaborate ruse in order to get Thomas to leave his apartment, so Nathan can stay there and live as Thomas in order to more firmly understand the actor's perspective. He trains with Thomas's nunchucks. Nathan's replica has an exceedingly flat affect, even more so than Nathan himself. It's a hyperbolic version of Nathan. In another session, the students demonstrate their proficiency in their primary's profession. It's clear they've made a lot of progress. Nathan gives them certificates to show that they have completed their training. Nathan then returns to family life. His kid Adam is much older now. The simulation has been progressing in Nathan's absence. He doesn't react in a fatherly way towards Adam, but Adam basically shrugs it off like it's no big deal. Nathan senses the inauthenticity of this exchange. After this interaction, Nathan asks the actor playing Adam to talk to him out of character for a minute. The actor suggests that he would feel resentment towards his father in this scenario. They perform the scene again with this emotional state in mind. When Nathan opens the door, Adam storms off to his room. Nathan asks the actor if he has any friends with similar abandonment issues. They play out various conflictual father-son scenarios. Angela seems reluctant to engage in these scenarios. Yet again, Nathan has managed to make it about himself. Adam and Nathan's relationship starts to deteriorate within the simulation, of course. He begins to suspect that Adam is doing drugs. Nathan and Angela confront Adam. Angela tells Adam about her past experiences with drugs. Nathan interrogates him. Nathan then has a conversation with Angela. He expresses the desire to go back to age six. Angela is confused but reluctantly agrees. Nathan and Adam play out an overdose scenario. The scene is very emotional. It is not played for laughs. Adam runs away after being taken out of the house by paramedics. He runs off into the darkness. The older actor playing Adam is subsequently replaced by a younger actor. The older actor who has been playing Adam goes through a slide and comes out a young child. The older actor then climbs out of the top of the slide, calling attention to the artifice of the scenario. Episode 4 is somewhat disjointed in its presentation of various themes. For starters, it expounds on a dichotomy more firmly established in prior episodes, the distinction between work and domestic life. The first half of the episode pertains strictly to Nathan's acting workshop. In the second half, we return to the so-called homestead, in which family problems abound in the wake of Nathan's prolonged absence. This episode depicts Nathan's relentless pursuit to understand other people. Yet in this pursuit, he continually alienates others. 
For starters, Nathan establishes himself as a teacher, which of course creates a certain kind of distance between himself and his students. The power dynamic prevents students, specifically in this case Thomas, from being fully honest with respect to his feelings about the class. Moreover, Nathan's approach entails forced encounters in which actors are assigned to various primaries. While it's not immediately obvious upon an initial viewing, I noticed during subsequent viewings that Angela is subtly marginalized with respect to her role in the parenting simulation. Recall that this entire rehearsal was supposed to be for her. Meanwhile, Nathan is allowed to play out various scenarios in order to grapple with his role as an absentee parent. The quote-unquote father in this simulation compensates for his absence by making his presence practically overbearing. While Angela attempts to relate to her pretend son by relaying her own experiences with drugs and alcohol, Nathan, in the course of playing his role as a dutiful father, opts to interrogate him. Ironically, this further drives away his adolescent son, Adam. Nathan is clearly aware of this process, and he seems to be taking a certain kind of perverse joy in letting it play out. This is possibly because it's such a realistic scenario, especially when you consider how sadly common opioid overdoses are in the U.S. Yet, despite the supposed realism of this whole scenario, Nathan himself is centered in these series of interactions. In the fifth episode, Nathan tries to get Angela to include Jewish traditions in their holiday celebration. This one begins with the infamous Dr. Fart scene in which Nathan shoots a short comedic video with young Adam, which culminates in Nathan eating a chocolate bar that is meant to represent feces. Angela disapproves. Sometime later, Nathan relays that he is determined to take his duties as a father seriously. Thus, he has decided he will not be doing any other rehearsals. With respect to their child's education, Angela suggests a faith-based homeschooling curriculum. Nathan's parents then pay a visit to the homestead. Nathan's mother encourages him to introduce Adam to aspects of his Jewish heritage. Nathan is reluctant because he doesn't want to upset Angela. Suddenly, Nathan has another epiphany. He realizes that his relationship with Angela is starting to resemble other relationships he's had in the past, real-life romantic relationships that he's had with other women. Specifically, Nathan has a tendency to avoid any issue that might lead to conflict, even when it's against his own interest to do so. To replicate winter, the production covers the house in fake snow. Nathan rehearses with a Fielder Method graduate who poses as Angela in order to prepare for a difficult conversation. His goal is to convince Angela to agree to allow their son Adam to learn about Judaism in addition to Christianity. The actress poses as a nanny in order to learn more about Angela. Nathan then asks Angela to do Hanukkah in addition to Christmas. Angela refuses as she believes Judaism necessarily entails rejecting Jesus. Nathan tries to change the subject. He asks Angela what her favorite movie is. Angela responds by saying that her favorite movie is Apocalypto, directed by the infamous Mel Gibson, a celebrity who is well known for having an unhinged anti-Semitic tirade after getting pulled over for a DUI. Nathan calls attention to this, but Angela doesn't seem to be aware. They start arguing. Nathan teaches Adam about Judaism against Angela's wishes. He bribes the kid with a yarmulke. Nathan relays to the audience that he actually thinks going to synagogue is boring. He is not a religiously devout person. Despite this, he wants Adam to learn more about Judaism but he realizes he doesn't know very much about his own faith, so he hires a teacher, Miriam. Nathan coaches the kid to lie to Angela. He even constructs an elaborate alibi. Adam is to relay to Angela that he's been taking swimming lessons instead of learning about Judaism. Nathan takes Adam to the basement to learn more about Judaism, calling to mind other historical occurrences in which Jewish people have had to hide because of their background. Nathan tells Miriam about his predicament. She suggests that they have a conversation with Angela. Miriam talks to Angela about how they're raising Adam. Angela doesn't budge on her position. Subsequently, Miriam calls her an anti-Semite. Angela defends herself. She says that Nathan has a habit of lying. In the next scene, 
Nathan uses the replica of the Alligator Lounge as an actual bar. He hires his Fielder Method graduates to run the place. Angela is still disturbed about the Dr. Farts movie. She says that eating poo is a satanic ritual. Nathan responds sardonically. He's clearly starting to get frustrated with Angela's paranoia surrounding the issue of Satanism. To top it off, Nathan discovers that Angela isn't taking the rehearsal all that seriously when he's not around. Again, Nathan rehearses with fake Angela. At this point, Nathan starts to lose track of which version of himself he's supposed to be at any given moment. He defends the premise of his comedic approach. It's silly and serious, he says. Fake Angela expresses concern that she's the butt of the joke. Then they play out the worst case scenario. Fake Angela says Nathan will never find what he's looking for because he is incapable of having a sincere emotional experience. This would seem to be Nathan's worst fear. Finally, Nathan talks to the real Angela. Again, she expresses frustration. She feels as though she hasn't been included in the rehearsal process. Subsequently, Angela quits. She diplomatically thanks Nathan for the experience, and Nathan carries on. Nathan explains to Adam that his mommy has left. Then he has Miriam over for a small Hanukkah celebration. Miriam reveals herself to be strongly pro-Israel, which clearly makes Nathan uncomfortable. Miriam encourages him to talk about how great Israel is on his show. He refuses to state his opinion and tries to change the subject as the episode comes to a close. This episode has a very discernible theme, namely it's about the inherent conundrum of maintaining a cohesive identity in the 21st century. In part, it's about the difficulty of maintaining a religious identity in the face of mounting challenges which come about as a result of modernity. There's quite a lot of baggage associated with this. As the end of the episode implies, it's a major can of worms. The clash of major world religions is certainly not a new thing, and it is important to note that the prevalence of religion in modern society has been waning considerably for some time now. Increasingly, society is becoming more and more secularized. Inevitably, certain individuals yearn for a time when prior forms of social relations organized around certain practices and beliefs were not only more sustainable, they were in fact the predominant form of social relations in most localities. And while these organized institutions can often be oppressive, it is nonetheless the case that religion has provided a sense of purpose and community to people all throughout history. For many, this sense of purpose and community is precisely what is lacking in our present moment. So naturally, there's a certain romanticism associated with the desire for a cohesive religious identity. Those who take pride in, for instance, saying they're Christian at a time when that trend is experiencing a significant downturn, these people often derive a certain libidinal satisfaction from the idea that they are marginalized in some way. This is nothing new, especially when it comes to Christianity. However, the conditions of modernity have invaded the consciousness of even the most devout Christians, and that is immediately evident in how they articulate their beliefs. Religion in the 21st century cannot effectively counter the broader societal forces driving people towards selfishness and solipsism. Instead, what's happened is that religious identities have become something closer to political and, perhaps more importantly, consumer identities. It's not so much that these beliefs aren't sincerely held, rather, it's the fact that even if adherents are completely sincere, the practice of certain predominant religions, specifically religions based on selflessness as a fundamental value, have become basically impossible to practice in a consistent manner as the nebulous spread of individualism has supplanted all previously existing values. And so, instead of a situation in which individuals work together in order to possibly actualize any existing belief system, belief instead becomes about performance and affectation. In the sixth and final episode of the season, Fielder deals with the fallout of a major screw-up. He's unintentionally manipulated a child into thinking that he's the kid's father. This episode is quite intense, and it concludes on a very strange note. Let's get started. Recall that Angela, the mother in this parenting simulation, has opted to no longer participate. 
In the wake of Angela's departure, Nathan tries to make the best of things. At the beginning of the episode, Nathan throws his pretend son Adam a birthday party. The crew preps various actors posing as birthday guests. In this particular simulation, Nathan had to use background actors as party guests, however, union rules prevent them from speaking. This creates a certain dissonance with respect to the simulation's accuracy. Awkward silence pervades the birthday party, giving the impression of a denuded, hollow celebration. Perhaps it would be fair to say that this is an ominous sign of things to come. Nathan sings Happy Birthday by himself. As the party draws to a close, a parent requests that Nathan explain to her kid that Judaism is pretend and that Christianity is real. Nathan tells the child that he, Nathan, is going to hell. The parent nods approvingly. One pesky six-year-old keeps sneaking into the party. His name is Remy. Nathan admits that he bonded with Remy. Remy doesn't want to leave the party. He starts crying. Remy's mom, Amber, explains that he doesn't have a dad. She says that Remy looks forward to seeing his pretend daddy. This is not a singular unnerving incident, rather, it is in fact the central conundrum that comes to define this episode of the rehearsal. After the ordeal, Nathan struggles to connect with another actor playing a slightly older version of Adam. Nathan stages an elaborate scenario in which Adam is bullied, so he can rehearse the act of coaching his child on how to deal with conflict. They practice what to do the next time a bully tries to mess with him. Yet Nathan is clearly distracted. His heart isn't entirely in it. He's still bothered by the situation with Remy. Nathan decides to visit Remy. He becomes enamored with the authenticity of their modest suburban home. Remy clearly wants Nathan to be his real father. Nathan tries to explain the concept of acting to the child, but he doesn't seem to understand. Remy starts crying. Later, Nathan consults the other child actor, the one playing an older version of Remy. He checks to make sure that this kid doesn't also think that Nathan is his father. Nathan tries to figure out what he could have done differently. He tries a new method, forced detachment, but it clearly defeats the entire point of the rehearsal. Then Nathan tries to use an adult actor to play Adam as a child, but this ends up being creepy and unhinged. Nathan then tries to eliminate the human factor from the equation entirely. He uses models, but this also comes across as creepy and unhinged. Nathan tries to replay various scenarios with an actor playing Remy to figure out what he did wrong. He wonders if Angela was perhaps the missing part of the equation. He reasons that if Angela was in the scenario as his fake mother, maybe Remy would intuitively understand that it was pretend because he already has a real mother. Nathan works with an actor in order to replay the last conversation he had with Angela. But no matter what he says, Angela still ends up taking her tea and leaving the room. He concludes that there is no plausible scenario in which he could have salvaged the relationship. Nathan then apologizes to the real Angela. He admits, I was the problem, not you. She accepts his apology and refers to scripture. She then encourages Nathan to forgive himself. Nathan decides to visit Remy again. He brings the older actor to see if perhaps that will help Remy understand the concept of pretend. Amber thinks that Remy will be okay, but Nathan is taken aback by her confidence. When Nathan and the older actor get back in the car, Nathan checks with the kid to see if he got enough material, indicating that the whole reason they were really there was to study Remy in order to portray him accurately. Nathan dresses up like Amber. They play out everything from the mom's perspective. He is clearly working through some major guilt. One gets the sense that Nathan is desperately trying to understand how this could have happened. Various scenarios play out. Remy's fake grandma expresses concern that Remy thinks Nathan is his dad. In the final scene, fake Remy starts crying. Nathan, still playing Amber, comforts the child. He says, I think it's a good thing that you're sad because it shows that you have a heart. At this point, things get a little weird. Nathan seems to get mixed up and says, I'm your dad. The child actor asks, aren't you supposed to be my mom? Nathan reiterates that no, he's the kid's dad. The child actor accepts this and they play out the rest of the scenario. And that is the final scene of the episode.
Naturally, one might question what it is they've just witnessed. In my view, the final episode of the season is, in some sense, a meditation on the nature of Fielder's comedy. There has been a fair amount of discourse on social media as of late regarding the ethics of Fielder's work, specifically his previous endeavor, Nathan For You. It would suffice to say that people are divided on his approach towards comedy. The rehearsal has generated a significant amount of conversation as well. That is, in my view, one of the hallmarks of a great work of art. I should note that Fielder's work does not generally rely on shock humor or blatant trolling as a method for generating attention. His work tends to be a bit more subtle. So, why does his comedy strike a nerve with certain moralistic crusaders on the internet? A lot of people seem to think that Fielder is truly a contemptible person. I am not generally a proponent of the idea of so-called cancel culture. I don't think people criticizing one of my favorite comedians online is a serious problem, nor is it even remotely a threat to his career at this point. If anything, they're simply fueling the discourse and generating more attention for his various projects. It's basically free publicity. Alec Robbins is an artist well-known for his comic strip Mr. Boop, in which Robbins is married to the well-known character Betty Boop. I'm not kidding. That's really what he's known for. In July of this year, Robbins shot off the following tweet. Okay, LOL, Nathan Fielder and Tim and Eric are exploitative and 100% should be criticized for it. They play around in murky waters and they always have. That's what makes their work interesting and funny, but it should absolutely be criticized, and that criticism is always valid. Naturally, the rehearsal seems to anticipate such criticism. One notable scene comes to mind. Specifically, there's a scene in which he's preparing to have a difficult conversation with his pretend partner, Angela. Per usual, he's hired an actor to run various scenarios with him. In one particularly difficult scenario, pretend Angela confronts Nathan about the premise of his comedy. She accuses Nathan of making fun of her. At this point, Nathan becomes extremely defensive. He claims that the point of the show is not to make fun of people, but rather to depict strange situations that bring out humorous reactions. This is a plausible defense of Fielder's comedy. In most cases, it's telegraphed in relatively clear terms. In Nathan For You, people are often depicted as quirky and weird, but one gets the sense that the comedy isn't mean-spirited. In fact, it's more often the case that this weirdness is actually celebrated, as opposed to being subject to ridicule. A cynic might call Fielder's approach condescending towards the people involved, yet Fielder himself is consistently depicted as the most pathetic figure in the series. Then again, he certainly wouldn't be the first comedian in the world to strategically employ self-deprecating humor in order to disarm his audience and obviate any potential criticism. Still, I can't help but point out the general thrust of Fielder's humor. It is fundamentally celebratory. All throughout Nathan For You and the rehearsal, weirdness is heralded as a life-affirming value. He acknowledges that people are highly flawed, yet behind every awkward interaction, there's an implicit opportunity for human connection. And occasionally, people will surprise you. So I would say Fielder's comedy is life-affirming. I basically view Fielder's body of work as a treatise against cynicism. While this rationale is explicitly asserted in the rehearsal, it is more generally the case that the work opts to call into question the very premise of Fielder's approach. At first, this line of questioning is playful, but gradually, it becomes more and more troubling. And in the final episode of the season, the stakes are escalated to a disturbing degree. It is inescapable that some power dynamic exists when it comes to Fielder's position as a showrunner, at least relative to the unknown subjects whose quirky personalities are continually mined for humor. But one might make the case that it's not for us to say whether a consenting adult is being treated unfairly. That itself is a condescending position, as it portends to know that individual's interests better than they do. And by adopting such a position, one presumes a level of knowledge that is dubious at best with respect to the production of this work. Ultimately, it's up to the parties involved to mediate such things. Or at the very least, this is not the type of thing that can be responsibly mediated on a website like Twitter, which is a platform fraught with bad incentives. 
Viewing art through an individualistic and primarily moral lens is a pitfall, in my view. The question of whether or not Fielder is an ethical individual is perhaps the least interesting question one could ask about his work. His behavior is called attention to in the rehearsal, specifically in the last episode. But rather than mount a full-blown defense of his actions, it would seem that Fielder is more interested in exploring this morally ambiguous terrain in artistic terms. That is to say, there's no attempt to respond to critics in sincere terms. Rather, perhaps it would be fair to say that the work aims to live the questions in the spirit of poet Rainer Marie Rilke. And when it comes to the ethical bind Fielder finds himself in, I believe he is merely a stand-in. Fielder is the hopeless neurotic that we have all become to one degree or another in 2022. And the problems we face now are beyond ethics entirely. In 1973, PBS aired a documentary series called An American Family. This series is largely considered the first reality TV show. Over 300 hours of footage was recorded over the course of filming. It was edited down to 12 hour-long episodes. As the name implies, the show began as an attempt to document the lives of an average American family, the Louds. What it ended up documenting, however, was the disintegration of a family. During the filming process, parents Bill and Pat Loud separated. Philosopher Jean Baudrillard asked a pressing question. Was TV itself responsible? What would have happened if TV hadn't been there? He discussed the documentary series in his book Simulacra and Simulation. Baudrillard, a noted Marxist, was writing in the wake of a major failure on the part of the radical left in France. It's perhaps fair to say that he became a bit jaded. Yet, embedded within simulacra and simulation is an incisive criticism of the complex technological behemoth at the heart of society, a behemoth which now stands in for community and increasingly precludes the very possibility of human connection. In reference to an American family, Baudrillard aptly pointed out that the entire premise of this little experiment was in actuality something of a paradox, a self-contradictory idea. The producer's triumph was to say, they lived as if we were not there. An absurd paradoxical formula, neither true nor false, utopian. The as if we were not there being equal to as if you were there. This is utopia, this paradox that fascinated 20 million viewers, much more than did the perverse pleasure of violating someone's privacy. The allure was not that of, say, a voyeur who gets off on violating someone's privacy, but rather the implicit expectation that the subjects in an American family are in some sense authentic. This notion of authenticity is precisely what Baudrillard criticizes as utopian, because of course, how can someone be authentic with a camera in their face? He argued that the success of an American family indicated a paradigmatic shift in the broader culture. Social cohesion is now achieved not through direct methods of persuasion, but rather something altogether distinct from earlier, more obvious forms of propaganda. It's a difficult thing to describe because there's not one single culprit that can be discerned. It isn't simply the media or money in politics as some often claim. On the contrary, the problem is more diffuse. Baudrillard notes, truth is no longer the reflexive truth of the mirror, not the perspectival truth of the panoptic system and of the gaze, but the manipulative truth of the test that sounds out and interrogates, of the laser that touches and pierces, of computer cards that retain your preferred sequences, of the genetic code that controls your combinations, of cells that inform your sensory universe. He somewhat cryptically refers to this as the last stage of social relations, the death of the social altogether. Simulacra and simulation marks an important turn in Baudrillard's body of work. Namely, it indicates a concerted shift in emphasis from economic concerns to that of mass communication. 
The common through line in Baudrillard's writings is an interest in semiotics stemming from the works of linguist Ferdinand de Saussure, the originator of a school of thought known as structuralism. I've explained the basics of structuralism before, but here's a quick primer. Structuralism regards language as a system composed of units known as signs. The sign has two essential components, the signifier and the signified. The signifier is the word itself, or rather, the sounds used to indicate an idea, as well as the markings used to denote the word in writing. The signified is the idea that the word is used to convey, but language is not directly referential. Despite the best efforts of language prescriptivists, there is no ultimate authority that dictates the meaning of words. Rather, the meaning of a particular sign is generated through its differential relation to other signs in the system that constitutes the entire language. A tree is a tree because it's not a rock or a river or a squirrel. Words are not assigned a meaning by God. It is rather the case that language is passively assimilated, to quote Saussure. Baudrillard deviates from Saussure in some respects. Namely, Baudrillard believes that we have entered a period of time in which the sign has taken on a rationale of its own. In traditional structuralism, the sign stands in for some physical thing, a referent. One of the key concepts in Baudrillard's work is the hyperreal, the more real than real. Hyperreality can be understood as a massive network of references without any discernible reference. Baudrillard says hyperreality and simulation are deterrents of every principle and every objective. They turn against power, the deterrent that it used so well for such a long time. Because in the end, throughout its history, it was capital that first fed on the destructuration of every referential, of every human objective, that shattered every ideal distinction between true and false, good and evil, in order to establish a radical law of equivalence and exchange, the iron law of its power. If the rehearsal resonated with you, I think you might already understand the hyperreal on an intuitive level. Yet, this is not an idea that can be unpacked through some kind of systematic, analytic breakdown. In some sense, it defies logic itself. The hyperreal is an elusive topic, philosophically speaking. A lot of philosophers flat out reject Baudrillard, and not just on analytic grounds. They don't simply take the position that Baudrillard is wrong per se. They take the position that he's unintelligible, that he doesn't have a coherent argument. At times, I think that's probably true. However, I also found simulacra and simulation to be prescient, almost disturbingly so. But this is a horror channel, after all. While it is seemingly impossible to discuss the phenomenon Baudrillard is attempting to describe in systematic terms, it is easy enough to provide a few palpable examples which will perhaps leave a sufficient impression of Baudrillard's hyperreal. At the very beginning of Simulacra and Simulation, Baudrillard says, Simulation is no longer that of a territory, a referential being, or a substance. It is the generation by models of a real without origin or reality, a hyperreal. If anything validates Baudrillard's philosophical views, it's the fact that algorithms increasingly shape our reality in ways that are often beyond comprehension. The rapidly accelerating proliferation of data models is a testament to the Baudrillardian view of the world, if it can really be called the world once this line of thought, this critique of such terms, is realized. Take for instance the YouTube algorithm which shapes the viewing experience of literally billions of people. It does so by collecting massive amounts of data and employing an elaborate, somewhat mysterious logic in order to determine what it should show to any given user. This logic thus creates its own blanket over our own reality. It operates as a kind of simulated reality. It establishes the bounds of the viewer experience within the confines of the platform. And this is just one of many such algorithms that have come to dominate, indeed define, what it means to be a person in 2022. When models themselves come to impose their own rationality on society, the distinction between the real and the unreal becomes unclear. As a result, the question of what is real is subsequently papered over. The real and unreal are laundered into something altogether distinct the hyperreal, the more real than real. This is the fundamental problem Baudrillard is attempting to grapple with. Baudrillard says, 
A hyperreal, henceforth sheltered from the imaginary and from any distinction between the real and the imaginary, leaving room only for the orbital recurrence of models and for the simulated generation of differences. Touching back on the concept of homesteading, perhaps it would be fair to say in the spirit of Baudrillard that homesteading in 2022 is a simulacra. In the early days of the United States, the vast abundance of land in the country created a situation in which average citizens could choose to engage in something beyond the confines of their proletarian class background. Instead of being a worker on the factory floor, they could opt to go west and stake out a plot of land for themselves. Yet, in 2022, there is no location on earth, no dimension, no point in space-time, that escapes the pervasive grasp of market logic. Homesteading is just one example of an entire way of life that has become detached from its original context. It is not dissimilar to the practice of live action role playing, otherwise known as LARPing. It is a performative activity carried out by those who wish to live in some past moment where the machinations of capitalism and the complications of modern life can simply be forgotten. Yet, this homesteading aesthetic does not represent any particular past reality. It is not romanticism of the past that drives the aestheticist per se, but rather the image of the past which stands in to represent some nebulous wonder recognized as an altogether new lifestyle, and thus it is sold to us by advertisers trained in the school of lifestyle marketing, to use a tortured euphemism. The notion that this is any sort of pioneering is demonstrably false. There is no territory left to explore. The image of homesteading is merely something that appeals to a consumer demographic. Instead of escaping the system, they have been sold the image of an escape. Lifestyle marketing is perhaps the most devious form of propaganda in human history, and this demographic will not exit the stage of consumerism. In all likelihood, they will continue to buy things to support this lifestyle. Baudrillard maps out what he refers to as the successive phases of the image over the course of history. First, the image is recognized as a reflection of some profound reality. Second, the image stands in as a mask for that reality. Its function is to distort reality in some respect. Third, the image serves to mask the absence of any profound reality. And finally, any relation the image has with reality is severed entirely. The image has nothing to do with reality. In this final phase, the image serves as its own pure simulacrum, in Baudrillard's terms. I believe that each of these successive phases are represented in the rehearsal to such an extent that it's almost uncanny. I can't imagine that this is intentional. Rather, I believe Fielder is attempting to grapple with some of the broader societal problems described by Baudrillard, and his work converges in some sense with the issues discussed in Simulacra and Simulation, in addition to other works written by Baudrillard such as Fatal Strategies. Let's map out these phases in relation to the rehearsal. In the first phase, recall that the image is recognized as a reflection of some profound reality. Let's review, for instance, the rehearsal scenarios of Skeet in the first episode. The alligator lounge replica is so highly detailed that it has a certain power. The high resolution image, if you will, provides Core with the confidence to proceed with the rehearsal. In the second phase, the image stands in as a mask for reality. Its function is to distort reality in some respect. This is hinted at towards the end of the first episode, and it is reiterated at various points over the course of the season. The parallel between Nathan and Willy Wonka is useful in this context. Recall that Nathan essentially fed Core the answers to all of the trivia questions so as to increase the chances of a successful confession. He then opted not to tell Core about this deceitful behavior. This kind of misdirection would seem to be common practice with respect to Fielder's comedic approach. Subsequent references to Nathan's deceitful behavior call to mind this second phase. In the third phase, the image serves to mask the absence of any profound reality. This begins to occur towards the latter half of the rehearsal, specifically in reference to Fielder's acting workshop. Nathan poses as an acting guru when in reality, he's a comedian. 
This is well-trodden territory for Nathan, and it relates to Baudrillard's second phase in which the image distorts reality. Yet, when Nathan himself begins to carry out elaborate rehearsal scenarios from the vantage point of a random student, this is suggestive of the third phase in which the image papers over, in some sense, a distinct lack of profundity. In a direct sense, there is no deep insight to be gleaned from Nathan's actions. He's essentially manipulating acting students. The so-called fielder method is simply a humorous stunt, and the act of rehearsing this stunt over and over is itself a performance crafted to signify the basic emptiness of Nathan's inner life. The entire production is in some sense masking this emptiness. Now, recall that in the fourth and final phase, any relation the image has with reality is totally severed. This occurs in a somewhat convoluted fashion towards the very end of the season. Recall that in the sixth and final episode of the season, Nathan poses as Amber, the mother of Remy, the child who formed an attachment with Nathan and referred to him as his pretend daddy. While this role-playing session is presented so as to suggest that Nathan is trying to understand things from the mother's perspective, there is a concerted break in the final moments of this episode. A bizarre sort of disassociation occurs in this scene. It's difficult to describe in a totally coherent manner, but essentially Nathan calls for a shift in context during the scenario, which prompts his scene partner to become confused. At first, the role playing as Amber and her son Remy in order to better understand things from Amber's perspective. Nathan, posing as Amber, has an intimate moment with Remy. He then gives the actor posing as Remy the cue to refer to him as dad. Nathan's motivations are not thoroughly explained. This choice comes totally out of left field. And this is precisely the moment in which the rehearsal becomes totally detached from reality. It is completely unhinged. Of course, one might argue that this is Nathan's way of coming to terms with the fact that he really does want to be a father. Yet this elaborate display of neurosis would seem to indicate that he is not emotionally prepared for that kind of responsibility. As I've previously stated, the rehearsal deals with some fairly heavy themes. In particular, the increasing difficulty of forming meaningful relationships in our present moment. Throughout history, artists have grappled with this thing called the human condition. I believe that the term itself has been outmoded and is largely useless at this point. The sheer vertigo produced by the rehearsal's layers upon layers of fictive reality serves to illustrate that there is no one essential quality that can be nailed down in order to identify the human subject. But this is not a tragic observation. The diversity of experience is part of what makes life so interesting. Beneath the layers of convoluted performances within this work, there is very clearly a yearning for human connection. The rehearsal does not present any conclusions with respect to the possibility of connection. However, at the very least, it does problematize the idea that healthy social relations are sustainable when hyperreality reigns supreme. Both Nathan For You and the rehearsal celebrate the beautiful and inherently absurd nature of existence in the postmodern trajectory. In this respect, Fielder's work can be understood as an artful refutation of cynicism. In Baudrillard's terms, Fielder seeks to establish a base of operations in the desert of the real, where the last vestiges of sociality remain. To quote Baudrillard, it is the real, not the map, whose vestiges persist here and there in the deserts that are no longer of the empire, but ours. The desert of the real itself. If there is anything meaningful to be retrieved from Fielder's work, it's that authenticity still exists out there despite the increasingly fake world we live in, though it may not be discoverable in the places where it is typically marketed. Rather, authenticity exists in the mundane, everyday interactions between exceedingly normal people. Of course, these interactions are sometimes awkward and even incredibly uncomfortable. Everyone is fallible. While increasingly it seems we are driven to isolation and solipsism, we really ought to cherish the weird and wonderful aspects of existence. 
This may in fact be our only path to meaning in the 21st century. That wraps it up for this installment of Nightmare Masterclass. If you enjoy my videos, maybe think about supporting me on a monthly basis at patreon.com forward slash nightmare masterclass. Thank you for watching and good night.